This is the largest mushroom in North America. It's also the rarest one, with one other exception. This grows in Washington, Oregon. Uh, it's called Grigioporus nobilismus, the noble polypore. It's probably about 300 to 400 pounds uh, in size. It grows exclusively as, as an old growth mushroom. We've tried to cultivate it. It's not been able to be cultivated. But another interesting example, and you can see this forecast in the data. The mycelium, when it grows, becomes very tenacious. This is ropey mycelium, and these are actually braids of mycelial strands that are woven together. And I did a calculation, and this braid of mycelium held more than 20,000 times its mass. So the mycelium, when it grows through the habitat, is tenacious, it grips the habitat, and holds it together. A manly man photograph here, standing on a log. And um, the decomposition of these logs in the wood debris in the ecosystem is extremely important, not only for the carbon bank, but for regenerating soils. The mycelium takes, in this case, apophytic my, uh, fungi, take wood chips, when the mycelium goes through it, lots of things happen. Ultimately, soil is created. Saprophytic fungi are the, are, the, are the soil magicians of nature. They are the, they are the molecular, molecular disassemblers that break down complex organic tissue into simpler forms, and doing so up-channeling nutrients to all sorts of other uh, organisms uh, in the food web. I took this photograph a few months ago. Uh, Dusty and I uh, were hiking, and we saw this, this soil lens. And if we go back 10,000 years at the end of the last ice age, what happened as the glaciers receded, you know, the ice melted, and I think most of you have been around, uh, around, uh, around these glacial fields, enormous amounts of silt flushes into the ocean or into the streams. And these, these are gravel beds, basically, around the glaciers. And there's very, very little soil. There will be some small islands will form. There will be some plant communities that will start to grow. They'll mature. They'll, they'll die. They'll be watered by fungi. The soil lines become a little bit larger. And this then repeats itself over and over and over. And so after 10,000 years, this is the soil that we are dependent upon. It is so thin. And yet the loss of soils around the world is probably the greatest threat that we face today and that we should all be concerned about. The mycelium responds to four primary uh, environmental stimuli that triggers the mycelium to go into mushroom production. Now bear in mind the mycelium can exist for hundreds of years, potentially thousands of years, before a single mushroom comes up. Many of these mushrooms come up seasonally, like oyster mushrooms and, and chanterelles, etc. The mycelium when it, there is a, it's triggered in the mushroom formation when there's a drop in temperature, and that's why the mushroom season in the fall is greater than the mushroom season in the spring. And there's an influx of water, and when there, the influx of water, the mycelium wicks to the surface, exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen, so oxygen being the third stimulus, uh, and then the mushroom mycelium is exposed to light. Even though the mushroom mycelium has no chlorophyll, they're incredibly photosensitive. Only a very few mushrooms that we can cultivate are not photosensitive. The primary one being the button mushrooms. So the vast majority of mushrooms that are cultivated, 99% of them, require light. Those four environmental stimuli are critical for mushroom formation. And then pff, mushrooms can form very quickly, just in a matter of a few days. And here's day 23 of oyster mushrooms, day 25, day 27. The mushrooms then sporulate. The mushrooms do not have a good immune system. They're like ripened fruit, and they're called fruit bodies of the mycelium. The mycelium has a very active immune system because there are single threads of cells running through the soil where the mushroom is laminated with hundreds of cells of wall, uh, cell walls uh, thick. And then, but I'm really fascinated by how mushrooms rot. So after sporulation, like salmon, after they spawn, they go <coughs> to the ecosystem. And so here's a rushula mushroom in the old growth forest in the meadow. A few days later, spores are germinating, lots of other things are happening, and we progress further, and then the mushroom mycelium goes subterranean, goes underneath. In a single cubic inch of soil, that can be more than eight miles of these cells. I um, estimate that my foot covers about 300 miles of mycelium. The mycelium is a fabric of individual cells that are woven as a microfiltration membrane. And so when there's a flow of nutrients carried, <coughs> carried by water, they get trapped into this net. And then these little cavities fill up with water. And then as it dries out because of lack of rain, these little cavities, uh, little wells of water lose their water resources one at a time. So 
only in its habitat has water retentive. It holds a, it creates a spongy-like environment. All of you who walk through the old-growth forest, you, you step on the duff and you felt that bounce factor. That is because the, the soil underneath your feet is honeycombed with mycelium. And then after water pockets are, are lost, then they fill up with high carbon dioxide environments. And the antimicrobial property of the mycelium sets up the stage of the microorganisms that are essential for the plants that give rise to the trees and uh, creating the debris fields that then feed the mycelium. This is the mycelium growing over about 45 minutes. Two movies by my friend Patrick Hickey. First, there is a growth of the mycelium and then cross hatches to consolidate control. This next movie that Patrick made is absolutely astonishing because prior to his work, we were looking at pretty much uh, at the preparations of mycelium uh, under a microscope where the life cycles have been slowed way, way, way down, uh, or they, they were basically static. And so Patrick's work here has just been absolutely phenomenal. We now know that bundles of nuclei uh, are projected through the mycelial networks. And in the meter diameter amount of mycelium, there can be trillions and trillions of, of, of end branchings. And those students who are here, you probably have heard about epigenesis. This is epigenesis in, in high gear. A trillions and trillions of end branches of mycelium. If there's a new insect, a new chemical toxin, a new potential food source, if there's a reassortment of DNA that produ produ produces a new strategy, a new way that the mycelium can capture that as a food, what happens? The mycelium, by definition, surges. It grows forward. And then the, the information of that new enzyme, that new acid, that new strategy of capturing that food source then back channels to the mother mycelium. So at trillions of experiments occurring with the mycelium and the meter diameter of passive mycelium, these are self-learning networks. And this is extraordinarily exciting for lots of researchers, including a group of researchers in Japan who were looking at a slime mold. And this is a maze experiment. Uh, this is in tissue culture. There's five N uh, points that you can escape the maze here. Uh, two two uh, flakes of oak Oat, oat flakes were put at two exits of the five, and the mycelium then would grow and randomly explore, and then after a few hours, it shut down the random pathways, which are unsuccessful, and then streamed it to the shortest proximate distance as possible, <coughs> memorizing the, the path of the maze. Well, that was the preliminary research, but this takes it to a whole new level. <coughs> so it's called Pfizerium polycephalum. And so these researchers decide, well, why don't we, since they live in Japan, see if the slime mold can redesign the Japanese subway system. So he compares Tokyo, the subway cities around Tokyo, and so each of these is an oat flake. The slime mold's put it in the center, in zero hours to five hours, grows out, grows out random in 11 hours, 26 hours later, shuts down all the non-essential pathways and redesigned the Japanese subway system in a more efficient way than is meant than is designed today. Moreover, <laughs> mathematicians got very excited and they ran the mathematical models and it optimized mathematically the most proximate distances possible, thus conserving its own biological energy for exploitation of the habitat. So if you have an engineering or mathematical problem, maybe you should consult a slime mold. <laughs> so I'm gonna wax a little poetic because this is this is central to my own personal belief system. The mycelial, mycelial archetype is shared throughout nature. You know, brain astrocytes resemble that of mycelium. And looking at the mycelial networks, they also are, are based on the same network design that the computer internet is based upon. My wife and I postulated in the early 1990s that the mycelium is Earth's natural internet. Again, I have a number of my fellow researchers who accuse me of eating too many magic mushrooms. I don't deny that either. I'll never be an apologist for my experimentation in that area. But I personally believe that the invention of the computer internet is an inevitable consequence of the previously proven evolutionary successful model. We've invented this, this at this time of crisis, information sharing networks at a time critical to, to helping this planet survive and the biosphere and all the other organisms. 